It's not just a life-giving source. We depend on it for transportation, for industry, for recreation. From the Florida Keys to the vast inland seas known as the Great Lakes, people have always been lured by the spell of the water, but not without a tragic cost. More than 240,000 square kilometers in size, the Great Lakes make up the largest inland body of fresh water on the planet. Friday, November 7th, 1913. The Great Lakes have never been busier. Probably the best way to think about the, the Great Lakes in 1913 is to think of it as the 401 of the day. For the movement of people, it was a very important, um, important transportation route. Also for the, for the movement of goods. On this particular Friday, on the northern shores of Lake Superior, Captain William Wright supervises the loading of the James C. Carruthers, the newest and largest freighter on the lake. The Carruthers had been launched that same year and the Carruthers was a big vessel. It was 529 feet long, uh, and it was a steel ship. The Wexford is everything the big freighter is not. Older, smaller, and slower. She was a salty or an ocean design, so she was peculiar in that she wasn't typical of what you'd see on Lake Huron. She was uh, one of those uh, vessels that was at the crossing point between sail and steam. Wexford Captain Bruce Cameron is watching the skies. He is experienced enough to know that the Witch of November is at hand. November is one of the most volatile months because you still have the warm southerly tropical moisture coming in from the Gulf of Mexico. And usually in mid-late October, you start to see some really good surges of polar air into the Great Lakes. And what happens is that you get this, this clash of the atmosphere and the, and the air masses, and you can develop some strong storms, especially with the wind. For captains and crews across the Great Lakes, there is only time for one or two more deliveries. They worked very, very hard during the actual shipping season, especially towards the end of the season. The pressure was on by the first and second week of November to get those last trips in to get that profit margin up. In Sarnia, on the southern shores of Lake Huron, a small Canadian freighter, the Regina, is being loaded. This is Captain Ed McConkie's first season as the ship's skipper. He's eager to squeeze in one more trip, despite storm signals hoisted in the harbor. Like most shipmasters, McConkie is suspicious of any warning issued by the Weather Bureau. Weather prediction at the time in 1913 was pretty much on a mold where they looked at surface observations and had contact with the different offices upwind from them. It was all very antiquated and very limited. It was said that shipping lines hired men who would use the barometer only as a coat hook. You know, they had to hang their coat over the barometer or the hat over the barometer. These were men who were used to ignoring weather warnings. One man who cannot ignore the warnings is Milton Smith, assistant engineer on the Charles S. Price. The Price is the pride of the Great Lakes, and few crew members voluntarily leave before season's end. 
But something tells Milton Smith that he must do just that, and it has to be today. His chief engineer, John Groundwater, cannot believe that Smith is willing to give up his end of season bonus for a vague premonition, but cannot change the crewman's mind. Friday afternoon, November 7th, 1913. The configuration of red and white lanterns at weather posts indicate gale force winds of 112 kilometers per hour or more. Several ships have already left port. In 1913, uh, we had no hurricane warning on the Great Lakes and because it was believed that we would not have a hurricane force storm. Ships already on Lake Superior are hit by the first punch of the storm. The largest of the Great Lakes becomes a giant cauldron of writhing water and yowling winds. The LC Waldo leaves port two hours before storm warnings are raised. Now, an angry sea is trying to tear it apart. Pounding waves smash into the deck house at the bow of the ship, which encloses the captain's bridge and wheelhouse. It shatters windows, tears away the roof, and destroys the ship compass and steering system. To cross the long, low deck of the Waldo during a storm is madness. Captain John Duddleson and his wheelsmen have no choice. And the captain and the wheelsmen went to the emergency steering platform at the stern of the ship and they tied themselves there. And the captain had a hand compass and a lantern. And the wheelsman steered and the captain called the course throughout the storm. Throughout Saturday morning, November 8th, the storm grows steadily worse. Saturday afternoon, the winds suddenly change direction. Basically, the Arctic air was being pulled in all the way to the East Coast, and then what happened is it just pulled it right back toward the Great Lakes and the Eastern Great Lakes, and then you have that cyclonic flow going on, and as you imagine, like a spinning top. With the change in the wind comes a rapid drop in temperature. Ice builds up on battered masts and wheelhouses as the storm-stricken ships try to find shelter. They didn't know how much they were drifting to port or to starboard as a result of the wind that was blowing on the side of the ship. The visibility would drop to the point where you couldn't even see the bow of the ship. Sunday, November 9th, 1913. On Superior's south shore, the Henry B. Smith, one of the largest freighters on the lakes, is anxious to complete one last trip. Less than 30 kilometers out of port, the Smith and its crew of 25 are swallowed whole by the seething waters of Lake Superior. Ships were trying to meet their economic deadlines towards the end of uh, the shipping season. Um, the timing couldn't have been worse, and with this huge change in weather, uh, they got caught. It is only by sheer chance that other ships have escaped the clutches of the Lake Superior storm. Both the James C. Carruthers and the Wexford find shelter near Sault Ste. Marie. Although warnings are still posted, Captain Bruce Cameron and the other shipmasters feel that the worst is over. The local interpretation of what was happening was that things were getting better and the winds were dropping, the barometer was rising, so uh, Bruce Cameron uh, set out with the Wexford as did a number of other vessels. Many of those vessels are at the other end of Lake Huron, including the Regina and the Charles S. Price. As the Price makes its way upriver towards Lake Huron, second mate Howard Mackley blows the ship whistle for his wife Evelyn on shore. It is a tradition they have shared since their wedding 17 months earlier. Not far behind is skipper Ed McConkey and his Canadian package freighter, the Regina. As the day continues, weather systems over Lake Superior move south. The storm grows in strength. It not only deepened tremendously, it slowed up. Boy, that's why you had such strong winds on the lakes for so long. 
I mean, you're looking at 16 hours of uh, 60 to 70 mile an hour winds. On the east coast of Lake Huron, the James C. Carruthers heads for the shelter of Georgian Bay. Captain William Wright orders his wheelsmen to make the critical turn that will put them on course into the bay. Not far away, the Regina is also heading north. But Captain Ed McConkie is concerned, and he decides to turn back towards Sarnia. I think that my father was not an extremely excitable man. He loved, he loved the ship, and he loved his crew. So I think that he would, he'd feel that he could handle it. In making a turn in heavy seas, there is the danger of getting caught in the valley that forms between the waves. Now, with the winds and waves moving in different directions, the ship stays broadside, helplessly drifting in the rolling trough. Captain Ed McConkie tells his crew to prepare for the worst. You have 30-foot seas in those lakes, and uh, you're fighting for your own life to try and keep your vessel afloat. At home, Captain McConkie's wife and family wait for word that the Regina is safely into port. My mother said that she was not worried. She knew that there was a very bad storm. She felt confident that, that she would get a telephone call from him saying that he was OK. And they waited and waited for the long distance call. But it never came. Meanwhile, along the Canadian coast of Lower Lake Huron, Captain Bruce Cameron guides the Wexford south through icy seas. The Wexford was apparently trying to make Godrich Harbor, but Godrich Harbor is a very difficult harbor to get into if there is any sea running. There were several reports about whistles being blown from the Wexford. That night, there were residents in the town of Godrich um, and uh, employees uh, along the waterfront who reported hearing bells and whistles again or seeing lights even, which would indicate that she was still there, still waiting to uh, have the storm abate and, and make port. The storm does not abate for another 24 hours. Long after distress signals from the Wexford fade into the night. Monday, November 10th, 1913. The station captain at Port Huron spots the hull of a ship on the horizon. It is a lake freighter floating bottom side up, its name and identity shrouded by murky water. It is dubbed the mystery ship, a riddle to be solved in the aftermath of the great storm. Tuesday, November 11th, 1913. A farmer walking along the Canadian shoreline of Lake Huron sees something in the water. It is the body of a young sailor from the Wexford, frozen in the icy waters. It is the first body that washes ashore. His shipmates soon follow, along with debris from the small steamer. There's a documented report of a life jacket hanging in a tree on top of the bank from a site near Bayfield. And from that point south, we have bodies and, uh, and other material from the Wexford, including one of the lifeboats. 10 days after the storm, a piece of wood washes ashore near Godrich. On it is a brief, tragic message. I am with the boat lashed to the wheel. It is signed simply B by Wexford Captain Bruce Cameron. The young skipper's body is never found. In the grim week that follows, bodies continue to wash up on Great Lakes shorelines. The body of Emily Walker, a cook on the steamer Argus, is found wearing a life jacket with the word captain stenciled on it. When the body of the Argus skipper washes ashore, it is without a life preserver. The amount of wreckage that had come ashore was incredible. 
These ships were carrying lumber, they were carrying whiskey, they were carrying any household good you could think of. And all of this material was coming ashore in great piles. As more wreckage drifts in, it brings with it the unthinkable, that the grandest ship on the Great Lakes has gone down. It's difficult to say what happened to the Carruthers because it, you know, this was a brand new ship. She may have grounded out and uh, you know, poked a hole in her bottom that nobody noticed until it was too late. Soon after, a body is found with a familiar beard and a ring with the initials WW. It is the Carruthers captain, William Wright. North of Sarnia, two bodies come ashore in a lifeboat from the Regina. Eleven more bodies are found close by. Some are identified as crewmen from the Regina, but others are from the Charles S. Price, the first evidence that this freighter has been lost as well. All the bodies are taken by wagons to makeshift morgues in nearby towns. In the morning, two of my uncles boarded the train and went to Godreach, where many of the bodies had been washed up. They went to see if they could find my father's body, but they returned home that they, they had not found it. Many more arrive in Godrich with the sad task of identifying loved ones. Evelyn Mackley comes looking for her husband, Howard, second mate on the Charles S. Price. She never finds him. A week later, she receives a love letter from her husband, mailed just before his last trip. Milton Smith, the assistant engineer whose intuition told him to leave the price, is asked to identify dead shipmates. He recognizes his old chief engineer, John Groundwater. And the coroner looked at him and said, are you sure? I said, sure, I, you know, I worked with this guy. I know this man, you know, this is John Groundswater. He said, well, can you tell us why I was wearing a Regina life jacket? A number of bodies were, came ashore uh, with Regina life jackets on them, although they were from the Charles S. Price. Some speculate that the Price and the Regina collided in the storm and that life preservers were exchanged in the confusion. That theory is discarded on November 15th, when a diver identifies the mystery ship still floating upside down in Lake Huron. It is the Charles S. Price. There is no evidence of a collision and no sign of the Regina close by. Some wonder if the Regina didn't come upon the Price in trouble and try to help. Uh, it's not impossible that the Regina saw the uh, Charles Price go over, saw the men in the water, steamed as close as they dared, and threw life jackets to them for them to get into a lifeboat and attempt to rescue. That is really a, a remarkable act of courage if it did indeed happen. We'll never know if it happened. Funerals and memorial services are held in towns and villages along the Lake Huron coast many communities are devastated by the loss of so many of their own. The brothers and uncles and sons and cousins, it must have created a very grievous moment. Although this storm was of enormous proportions and bigger than anything that had been experienced before, uh, death and tragedy on the lakes was not uncommon. But in this particular circumstance, with so many lost, the pain must have been enormous. It is almost a year before the McConkie family is able to lay the skipper of the Regina to rest. The following summer, his body was washed up on the shores of uh, Michigan. He was still wearing his fur-lined coat. And in his pockets, he had several things that he had treasured. One of them was his diary and his gold watch. And my sister, Amy, writes about that occasion. And she describes my mother standing at the top of the hill waiting for the wagon or hearse, it would be hearse. She described my mother as, as 
looking happy. She said, I, I wondered why she could be so, could be smiling. But she said, your, your father's coming home, Amy. In terms of ships and crews lost, the storm of 1913 is the worst in Great Lakes history. 12 ships are at the bottom of the lakes and up to 40 more in need of repair. The exact number of dead will never be known. Ship owners and skippers blame inadequate forecasts and storm warnings, while the weather bureaus maintain that posted storm signals were ignored by ship captains. All these guys went sailing out into this thing, thinking it's just going to be a standard November blow. And it took 19 ships, 250 plus lives. An inquest leads to recommendations for improvements in the future. I think it cleaned up the way uh, weather reports were communicated to sailors. I think it did lead to some improvements in uh, lights and lighthouses along the lakes, generally. For years, the location of many of the lost ships remains a mystery. One riddle is finally solved in 1986 by a diver who finds his gear snagged on an anchor chain. The diver followed the anchor chain back to a ship, and the, the ship was lying on its side, and that was the SS Regina. And she was lying within a mile of the shore, In 2000, a fisherman using an electronic fish finder locates the biggest catch of all, the wreck of the Wexford, upright and perfectly preserved 120 kilometers off Huron's south shore. The way she sits today, she has no rudder, and she has a large chunk out of one propeller blade, so that would tell me that somewhere along the line she either struck bottom or um, through a combination of the wave action and rolling, her rudder was thrown out of the shoe and broken off and she lost steerage. The Great Storm is one of the worst tragedies in Canada's maritime history. 22 years later, the Florida Keys will experience one of the worst hurricanes to ever hit America. More lives will be lost and nature and human error will again be the cause. The Florida Keys are a string of small, lush islands, an almost 200-kilometer stretch of tropical paradise off the southern tip of the state and among the most popular destinations in America. In 1935, however, the Upper Keys are home to only a 1,000 people. There's no electricity, no running water, and indoor plumbing is a luxury. But for the children, it's a playground, especially on holidays like Labor Day. Elma Pinder and her sister Dolores come from one of the oldest families in Isla Morada, a small conservative community on Upper Matacombe Key. I can remember us kids walking from the beach, because uh, we lived at the end of Beach Road. We had a wonderful life. It was a beautiful place to be. On well, a typical day, we spent most of the time either out on the docks fishing, or in the boats, or in swimming. We didn't go anywhere because there was nowhere to go, really, except to fish and swim. And you know, well, I think our family was pretty much the this, this stable part of all Marana because they homesteaded all this area. Their father, Bert, makes his living doing carpentry work. Like all the houses in Isla Morada, he's built theirs on the beach to catch the cooling breezes. And it was made of wood. We had um, two bedrooms, and Daddy had added a bathroom to it because we didn't have bathrooms, you know, when we first lived there. And then there was a nice big living room and a dining room and a kitchen and we had a porch clear across the front of the house. Their stepmother, Bessie, works hard to provide a happy home. And this woman couldn't have been a better person than she was. She never had any children of her own, and she was really good to us. 
Family is very important in Isla Morada. Cousin Sophie is like a best friend to Alma. Well, uh, well, Sophie was my age, and we were real, real close friends. It is a pleasant life, but residents pay a price for living here, the constant threat of hurricanes. The Florida Keys and South Florida in general is the area in the United States that experiences hurricanes more often than any other part. In 1935, there are very few ways to check on the weather. Keeping an eye on the barometer is the most common. On Monday, September 2nd, the barometer starts to fall, but Alma and Dolores Pinder aren't worried. I always used to get excited if we had hurricanes because we could, you know, stuff and wash up on the beach. And I was just a kid, so I really, it didn't upset me. Down the beach, Ed and Edna Parker watch a family ball game. Ed makes his living fishing, and with 11 children, it isn't easy to make ends meet. We didn't have money. We didn't know we was poor until somebody told us. <laughs> I remember we, my sister and I wore the same size dress. We had one dress. We just loved. And we'd take turns wearing it. <laughs> Nearby, Charles Roberts' family is enjoying the last holiday of the summer. With his parents, Mary and Reggie, and his brothers, Earl and Jack, it is a typical carefree day in the Keys. Them days, it was nice, it was God's country. It was just so peaceful and quiet. That's all it was. The islands are fully connected by railroad, but it is the height of the Depression. And as a make-work project, the government hires World War I veterans to complete a highway. Their presence is strongly felt by the islanders. Living conditions in the veteran camps are harsh, with little concern for safety. The government houses them in wooden shacks with canvas roofs. And there was a constant comment amongst the uh, locals about, you know, when the major hurricane, uh, a major blow was about to take place that these poor souls would have this relatively flimsy type housing. The camps are managed by engineer Ray Sheldon. As Labor Day approaches, he is thinking about his upcoming wedding, not the weather, which is still calm and hot. Uh, there were indications that there was a storm forming north of uh, the Lesser Antilles, north of Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. Um, but it wasn't just a hurricane at that point. It looks like it was just a, uh, what they call a tropical disturbance. When ocean water is very warm, air rises, moving upward in a circular motion. If it turns fast enough, a hurricane forms. On Labor Day in 1935, this is exactly what happens. But the eye of the storm is tiny, just 12 kilometers wide and people on the Keys aren't concerned. The Weather Bureau said we wasn't gonna get it. Living by the ocean means keeping a constant watch. Every house has a barometer. Within hours, there are signs the Weather Bureau is very wrong. Daddy went to work that Monday morning and um, he came home about, about like noontime and he says, we gotta batten up. He says, because we're gonna get some bad weather. He said, the, the barometer keeps falling. My dad watched the barometer constantly. He told my mother, there's something coming, if a storm coming or something, we better get ready. While the islanders continue to keep watch, the barometer finally falls to the lowest reading in Florida history. It evolved to a category five hurricane which is the, the highest on the Saffir Simpson hurricane scale. At 4 p.m., anxious weather officials change their prediction. The hurricane is not going to miss the Keys, but hit head on, something the islanders already know. Dory and mother packed up everything, packed the dishes and everything up in the house, and I helped daddy batten up our house. In Isla Morada, 
the winds are now at gale force. At the Roberts home, Reggie and his wife get prepared. He said, Mary, he said, we better get ready and leave the house. He said, because we would live right on the water. So she got everything ready. By now, Ray Sheldon realizes the veterans are at high risk in their flimsy shacks. But it takes hours to arrange a rescue train. And there are other delays. It had to go through the drawbridges, all of the boat traffic. This took about 40 minutes of time to do all of this, which, which is, was one of the delays. So time is flying, and the hurricane speeding down on them, which they don't really know about. Meanwhile, Sheldon and all the veterans now, they've been waiting for hours. At 8 p.m., the rescue train finally arrives. As veterans pile into the cars, Ray Sheldon climbs into the locomotive, and the train begins to pull away. Meanwhile, the Pinders decide to move to the home of relatives, where cousins Sophie and Charles Foyle live. The weather was really bad, and the water was really rough. So we came over there about, it was just before dark, because Uncle Russell had a new house, and Daddy figured that we, you know, we would be safe. But unknown to everyone, this is not a typical hurricane. It is a storm of ultimate relentless power. The foil house shakes violently, and the roof starts to rip off. And we had all lined up to the back door to go out the back door, and the house disappeared. At 8.30, the hurricane hits with a force no one has ever felt, bringing with it an enormous wall of water. It crashes onto the island, flooding everything in its path. And we was in the house one minute, the next minute we was out in the water. In total darkness, the Pinders are immersed in water, desperate to keep from drowning. I was with Uncle Fred, and he was holding on to me, and I held on to him until he told me he couldn't take it anymore. Well, there was rubbish everywhere, but he pushed me up on something, you know, higher. Pushed me up there and, and told me to hold on. And it was my mother that I grabbed on to. And mother and I were still together and floating around, and I remember getting up on things two or three times and getting knocked down again. As the rescue train makes its way north, it is hit by the storm surge, instantly flooding the compartments and sending veterans crashing into each other. As they fight to keep their heads above water, the train is thrown off the tracks, landing in the raging waters. It was just torn debris, the railroad tracks were Horn twisted, washed off the track. As the keys disappear under the ocean, bodies bob helplessly in the violent waters. Incredibly, the house the Parker family is in holds together because it isn't tied to the ground. The house, like I said, moved and floated. The door blew in and the water started coming in. So that's when Daddy heard us in the bedroom. Then the door between the two rooms blew shut. The family is separated in two rooms. Their father, Edwin, can do nothing. And all he could do was hope that Janice and, and uh, Nolan and Austin was OK in the other room. It was too oh, chaotic. It was, it was terrible, you know, trying to keep. The water was coming in, the debris was coming in, some logs and stuff was coming in. In total darkness, the family senses the water rising, and with it, their terror. You couldn't see anything, nothing. And it was, the wind was blowing so hard that, it, you know, it, you couldn't hardly breathe. My oldest sister went to pieces. She started screaming and hollering. My mama said, now, sister, all you can do is pray. By now, the winds are raging at more than 300 kilometers per hour. At the Roberts house, the roof starts to come off. My dad said, we got to leave the house. The roof is gone. we got to go. He said, I know where a car is. We'll walk and see if we can find it. So he grabbed me by the old wrong strap, my other brother by the strap, and my mother had Jack, six months old, in her arms in a bag with her. But the violence of the storm makes it almost impossible to go on. 
she kept falling down because the wind was so strong. And she, he said, Mary, you've got to get up or we'll all be killed. So it was so dark and raining so hard, you couldn't see a hand in front of you. Somehow, Reggie finds the car, and the family piles in. Soon, others beg to be let in. They turned on the lights, and the people started to come. By the end of the night, it was 11 of us in the car. In the course of the evening, it was terrible. You know, the rock flying, the wood flying, and screaming and hollering. Their combined weight holds the car down, but there is no room for the dozens banging on the car doors. It was terrible because she couldn't do nothing for them, you know what I mean? There was too many out there. My dad maybe could bet one more and come back, but there was no room to put no more. You couldn't, it was, I was, I was, we were jammed up like sardines, you know what I mean? And it was nothing you could do for them, you know what I mean? It sure, it was horrible to hear it. It made you sick almost, you know? And I know my dad and mother must have been sick to the south to hear this, you know? Trapped by the incredible force of nature, the people of Isla Morada spend the most horrific night of their lives. No one knows who is alive and who is dead. All they can do is wait for the light of day. On Labor Day 1935, the upper Florida Keys are hit with a force no one has ever felt before. Well, the Labor Day hurricane uh, set a benchmark for many years of what is the strongest possible hurricane that could ever occur. Twelve grueling hours later, the hurricane moves northward, finally dying off the Canadian coast of Newfoundland. As the water retreats, the devastation in the Keys is incredible. After the hurricane was over, Isla Morada was looked more or less like Hiroshima or something, like an atomic bomb had hit it. And we were shocked. The more we looked, the more, you know, everything was gone, like a deserted island. It was terrible feeling, pity the stomach. There are no trees, and almost every structure is destroyed. Alma and Dolores Pinder survive by holding on to a wall sticking out of the ground. Their stepmother is trapped under a sheet of wood and can't move. But I didn't realize how bad mother was. Mother was really hurt bad. She had a broken back, and both collarbones were broken, her ribs were crushed, and she was just skinned from head to foot. I remember sitting, sitting there waiting for somebody to come, you know, to help me with mother because I couldn't do anything. Miraculously, their father finds them. He is battered but alive and brings terrible news. Their cousin Sophie, Alma's best friend, is dead. Sophie was underneath the refrigerator. It was heartbreaking, really. Farther up the beach, the Parker family surveys the scene around them. That house would have gone to pieces had it not had it been tied down. It would have went to pieces. But not being tied down, it floated. So we were fortunate there, too. Shaken and exhausted, everyone in their immediate family is alive. But they, too, have lost many loved ones. So many of them died. So many of my friends died and family. I had an uncle and an aunt, and one nephew, one cousin, and so many friends that died. It's hard to believe, you know? It, you think, well, this is a bad dream, I'm gonna wake up. But it really is something to see. Charles Roberts and his family climb out of their car, still in shock from their ordeal. Incredibly, their car has kept them alive. If, if we wouldn't have got the car, if he wouldn't have known where that car was, we'd have been caught. When the survivors walk through the island, they are stunned by unforgettable scenes of pain and destruction. There were friends of ours that was walking, looking for their children, calling out for them. 
They didn't find them because they were dead. Bodies are everywhere. Many are killed by flying pieces of wood or sheets of iron. Most have drowned. Walking along that road was like a battlefield. The Roberts family comes across the overturned rescue train. Only one car is standing. The locomotive and its tender stayed on the track. It was huge. In one way, we could say that was pretty lucky because no one that was bored the train died. Having spent the night on the locomotive, Ray Sheldon has survived. But as he checks the other cars, most of the veterans are dead. At the veterans camp, the devastation is hard to comprehend. Going out was rough because where the veterans were, the veterans camp, there were so many of them dead on the ground. I saw so many of them. It was sad, you know, the heads bashed in and everything. But my mama was afraid she was gonna pass out. When the Army and National Guard arrive, they decide there are too many bodies to transport. More than 400 people have been killed. To avoid outbreaks of disease, the Army cremates them on the spot. You know, you're in early September when temperatures reach about 30 degrees Celsius every day, and um, you know, I'm sure it would have been a, a horrible scene, you know, dealing with these you know, few hundred uh, dead bodies. Um, you know, the cleanup must have been a horrendous process there. People soon question how they could be caught so off guard. Officials determine it was the hurricane's small size that caused its unusual strength, wrapping super destructive winds around it in a tight coil. A catastrophic hurricane, Category 5, was beyond anybody's experience. Such an event is extremely rare for any one location. So they, they, they had no idea, even the, even the long-term residents, of the, of the immense power that a hurricane could bring. The weather office isn't blamed, but the government and Ray Sheldon come under fire for taking so long to arrange a rescue. So they procrastinated in ordering the train. And I don't know if any of them really understood it was not like ordering a hamburger, you know. And they didn't have to die. Um, if there was plans um, that were a little more well thought out, they could have gotten the people out before the hurricane's eye arrived. With houses and services gone, families like the Parkers and the Roberts are evacuated to relatives on the mainland. It will take months to rebuild. For the severely injured, like Bessie Pinder, it takes much longer to recover. They called her a walking miracle because she pulled through it. You know, the doctor did bring her through it. The hurricane spells the end of the railroad, replaced by the highway that finally opens three years later. It also causes Florida to enforce the strongest building codes in the United States. Houses are rebuilt in concrete and steel. But even these are no match for a Category 5 hurricane. Even with our satellites and our radar and aircraft, and this would still be a very difficult forecast because going from a tropical storm to a Category 5 hurricane in less than two days, just we cannot forecast that with much skill at all. It would still be a surprise today. The September 1935 storm is recorded in history simply as the Labor Day hurricane. Category 5 hurricanes are extremely rare. Florida has only had two since 1935. Along the Great Lakes, the gales continue to blow, and from time to time, ships are still lost. Five ships lost in the great storm of 1913 have yet to be found, but those who sailed them are still remembered on both the Canadian and American side of the lakes. It changed the face of shipping on the Great Lakes. The lakes now had the respect of people who, prior to that, thought, well, these are only mud puddles. 
uh, when in reality I've known men who've gone around Cape Horn and say sailing in Georgian Bay and sometimes worse. For those who lived through that horrible September night nearly 70 years ago, nothing could be worse. But they know that respect for nature is sometimes only learned through tragedy. Labor Day here can really put all my water on the map. It's something I'll never forget, that's for sure. That was the worst night I went through in my entire life, and I still remember it like it was today, but anyway, it's hard to have any memory, but uh, life goes on. <laughs> 